One economist has welcomed the appointment of Cyril Ramaphosa's new cabinet. Professor Raymond Parsons says a leaner cabinet should prove to be a positive move. He also lauded the credible and experienced appointments but warns that the new ministers will be tested on their ability to rebuild confidence and deliver on their mandates. Parsons joins us now to discuss this. Good evening, Prof. Thanks very much for your time. So you reckon the broad economic message, um, as you put it, uh, from the reconfigure, reconfigured and leaner cabinet is potentially a positive one for business and the markets. Yes, that's important because I think this whole exercise about the cabinet, we must see it as an exercise in political economy. It's not a purely technical exercise. There are clearly important political factors and political decisions. The important thing is to unpack within it, what is the economic message? And it's quite clear that this team, which has been now been selected by the president, is to be dedicated in particular to turning this economy around. We know what the critical issues are there. Uh, because he had said that he was going to reduce the cabinet anyway, so he's yes, true yeah. to his word. But Yes, but I, I think that it's important that that sort of credibility is established. I said I would do something, and I've done it. And it's a process. I think, once again, one might argue, well, perhaps more could be done, and there are a lot of deputy ministers. I, I think one can nitpick if you want to. But I think one needs to stand back and say, no, this is a step in the right direction. Why would you call that nitpicking, though? Well, because... Suppose, I mean, it is a, a, a legitimate point, isn't it? Because if you are going to ask public servants to take voluntary severance packages, which is what the president has said um, is going to happen, then where you have control, you should actually demonstrate. I mean, yes, but I think, once again, what, what the president has said is that the process of streamlining the cabinet is a process. It's not all happening at once. It's not an event. So I think but one must. Deputy ministers do. One must allow some. They don't have any executive power. No, one hardly th knows what they yes, do. Yes, but I think they are entirely at the mercy of their principles. There is another dimension, which has not been discussed in this high-profile debate about the cabinet and the deputy ministers. The fact is, the last few years have seen a serious instability in the directors general of various departments. The turnover has been enormous, and it has contributed to the policy uncertainty that the private sector doesn't know who they're dealing with because one year it's one person and another year it's the next. But now, what is important... But hardly have any influence on that. But the whole point is they should because they are, in fact, the chief executive officer of the ministries. And for the new cabinet to succeed, you need to know that you have strong CEOs under you in the different departments to implement what is said, to implement what is decided at the cabinet. And for the time being, you will have to have some deputy ministers around to help you get to the point where the team functions more effectively as a whole, including the directors general. And I think that's a very important element we mustn't overlook. We mustn't look only to the ministers and the deputy ministers. We've got to say we need strong and, and capacity-driven directors general who will take what ministers have decided and make it happen. That's what CEOs do. And so that's another important dimension which needs to flow from the appointment of the new cabinet and to help the new cabinet to succeed in the huge challenges that we know are being faced by us and by the country. You, you also say that uh, the success of this cabinet will depend on, uh, quote, widening and deepening the relationship with key stakeholders in the economy, especially the business. I thought that's what the president has been doing already. I think that is what I'm reaffirming. We've now reached an election, a watershed election. We reached a fork in the road with a new cabinet. Uh, which is committed to, to certain issues which are of importance to our, to our economy and to business. And I think it's an opportunity now for the business community to engage with the new cabinet. Yes, there are some familiar faces on the economic front, but there is a fresh mandate, uh, an air of renewal in which the private sector must now indeed participate because we talk again, as I said earlier, we have huge capacity problems 
in the public sector, which is a, 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 an important explanatory factor for why so many things have gone wrong. Now's the opportunity with a new cabinet, with a new team, to engage with the private sector and say, please, let's have a genuine partnership. Let's widen and deepen what we started to do with the Investment Summit, what we started to do with the Job Summit. We now need to consolidate that and make it happen. Because I think a lot of the viewers are saying, we've reached a point now in the post-election and the post-new and the post-new cabinet stage where the rhetoric must be translated into reality. But in, at times when, um, the, when the times were good, for instance, the best years of uh, this democracy, when we talk about economic growth, for example, and Mbeki, right? Business was talking the same language. They were happy, but there was a feeling, certainly within the ruling party and the government, that business did not reciprocate. So how do we know that this time around, um, assuming everybody is as happy as you are, that uh, business will come to the party? In other words, they will reciprocate. I'm saying Put money where their mouths it's are. It's not just a question of the challenge that <clears throat> is facing the politicians of this country, but the fact that the future of the country is also too important to be left only to the politicians. Therefore, other stakeholders, and I'm including Labour, but we're talking about business now, business will now say, in terms of the commitments already made at the Investment Summit, the commitments already made at the Job Summit, which were only six months ago, but not much progress has been made because we've had an election and there have been other issues that have distracted both government and the private sector. Now I'm saying we have this opportunity now to make the start. We don't have to start with a clean uh, slate. We've got the, out, the, the commitments already made at the Job Summit, the commitments already made at the Investment Summit, but we're going to have to build. Those are just building blocks, just like the new cabinet is a building block on which we want to erect a, a far better future. And that is where we stand now. And that also tells all of us that what our experience of the last few years has said, that neither the government, nor business, nor labor can do it on their own. We're all in the same boat, and we're all going to have to sail in the same direction. And that is the opportunity that we now have. With the election behind us, with the new political team in place, it is now both an obligation on, on government and on the private sector to now join hands and say, we know the direction in which we want to go. Let's collaborate and make it happen. Because viewers out there who don't have jobs or are in poverty or are distracted and, and distressed by the state capture and the corruption that has been exposed are saying, we want to see outcomes. And that's the next important step that we need to take if we want to create a better life for everyone. And I'm saying that this opportunity we now have is for a greater collaborative effort to build on what we've said in the past and to make it happen in a tangible way. And that's we're going to leave it, Prof. Thank you very much for your time. Raymond Parsons is from the Northwest University's Business School.